I think this may be the last video for fractures, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so we've talked about how we align or stabilize fractures, and now we're going to talk about how we immobilize them. And usually the immobilization process is more of the long-term process. So, you know, we want to get things back into normal alignment because that's the only way a bone can heal. And then we want to keep it in place so it doesn't move at all. But, you know, bones take weeks to months to heal. So we need something that's going to keep it in that fixed place so that the um, bone can completely heal in that time. So there's a lot of different immobilizations devices. There are casts, braces, splints, immobilizers. We talked about external, internal fixators. Um, oh, excuse me. And lots of different ways to immobilize um, things. So you do not have to be able to identify necessarily all of these, but you do need to know about the nursing care around them, which I'll talk about next. Um, there's also, depending on if you fracture your spine, you might have um, a nice little TLSO bracelet here, a bracelet, huh? brace here, um, or a spinal brace here. Um, here in the middle is a C collar. Um, then we have a sling over here. So just depending on where the fracture is, what the issue is, there's lots of different devices. So what do I do as the nurse? Again, don't focus so much and try to memorize the devices. Focus on what am I going to do as the nurse? So usually um, for mobilization, um, we're going to uh, elevate um, the cast, cast an area with a sling or a pillow. We want to really avoid a dependent position for patients with these devices. Now, when I talk about cast specifically, usually elevation is just recommended for the first like 24 to 48 hours. Um, everyone's a little bit different. Um, but um, just know that elevation is usually a good thing. The only time we don't like elevation, do you remember, is in compartment syndrome. So, um, we like elevation, especially can help to, um, you know, decrease some of their edema and decrease, which decreases some of their pain. I want to monitor skin around all of these devices for pressure area. So depending on the device, you have to think about where's their pressure. So like in the C collar, I'm going to be watching around their chin, their neck, their, in the back of their neck here around their ears, because it has this blue padding here. Um, but if I don't put that on right, it can definitely lead to an issue. Um, then if they have this corset like brace, and I'm going to be watching the pressure around that, um, or like the sling pressure around their hand. Um, or a cast around their fingers, et cetera, a knee immobilizer around the top and bottom where it's putting pressure on the skin. I'm going to encourage movement of the fingers and toes or um, the areas around the joint. Um, we want to prevent stiffness, contractures. So let's say that I have an arm cast. Let's say it's a lower arm cast. I'm going to encourage, if, if the doctor says it's appropriate, um, depending on my injuries, encourage shoulder movement, finger wiggling, things like that. Um, with spinal and uh, body devices, the concern that I have here is we have to think about where is it putting pressure. So if I have one more in my upper chest, I'm going to be worried about some of the respiratory status issues or my diaphragm being able to expand. They could have respiratory complications or if the, um, the brace goes lower too, it could put pressure on my bowel or my bladder and lead to dysfunction there. So um, depending on where they have the device, you definitely want to assess for problems that could happen in that area. And then the other things are just going to be, you know, closely watching um, or feeling for the pulses and doing a good peripheral neurovascular um, assessment distal to the injury. So remember, you know, arm issue distal is my hand, leg issue distal is my foot. So general cast care that I give, like I mentioned, we apply ice and elevate and went for above the heart level for the first 24 to 48 hours. Now, remember, we also don't want things hanging down. So usually like keeping them more at level, um, you know, it definitely helps because we do not like things to be dependent um, or down um, because it can lead to swelling. We want to avoid getting the cast wet. Um, so usually like they can take a shower after a certain period of time, but we usually have to wrap um, the cast. Now we do not like to keep it wrapped long term. You don't keep it wrapped the whole time. Um, it can mess with the uh, material and stuff like that, but you can temporarily wrap it to take showers, things like that. Um, we already talked about regularly moving the joint above and below the cast. Um, we can also use a hair dryer on a cool setting for itching. Now, most of the time in the movies, what do you see? You see them like grab a pin or something and they're sticking it down in their cast and scratching. Um, you never do that in perfect nursing school world because at every hospital we have hair dryers readily available for itching needs. And I'm being sarcastic there. We don't usually have hair dryers available for itching needs, but remember most patients with fractures aren't going to be staying, um, with minor fractures aren't going to be staying in the, um, 
hospital uh, long term, usually coming and getting the cast and going home. So for the ambulatory patient, and I mean, for any patient, we're not sticking anything in their cast. Um, but just know, like most of these patients are going home and hopefully they have a hair dryer at home, put it on a cool setting, it will help with itching. Um, don't stick anything in. Um, we usually tell the patient, depending, every physician is different. So we'll always revert back to the physician, but don't bear weight on their new cast for 48 hours. Um, warning signs are like, these are going to be, when do they need to call their doctor? If there's increased pain, despite elevation, ice and medication. Hmm. Oh, let me put this pen down. Hmm. What could that indicate? If you're saying compartment syndrome, you're right. Um, if they're starting to have swelling and discoloration of their toes and fingers, hmm, more neurovascular compromise. <gasps> Could be compartment syndrome, um, pain during movements. So that's that passive stretch. So again, <gasps> compartment syndrome, um, burning, tingling under the cast or sores or foul odor could be a sign of <gasps> infection. If you said compartment syndrome, I'm sorry, you weren't right there. Um, but anyway, so we're looking for infection. We're looking for neurovascular or blood flow perfusion issues. Um, and uh, definitely want to let the physician know if any of those are coming up. So we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I also want to support a patient that might be one of these devices with their mobility. Um, you know, physical and occupational therapy is going to be a super help to like, say like what are their restrictions, you know, how to help transfer them. They're going to help a lot day to day. Um, but when I'm helping the client, I want to make sure that I'm encouraging them to move because staying in the same position is not helpful. They do need to move and prevent other complications of immobility, constipation, pneumonia, things like that blood clots, um, but using, um, moving as the, as prescribed as they're allowed to, but make sure I'm being, doing it safely, like gate belt, extra, um, ambulatory or mobility devices like canes, crutches, things like that. Assistive toiling devices will oh, have gate belt for safety twice. Okay. I got to take that out. Just talking to myself. Uh, but again, we talked about knowing their weight bearing status. So weight bearing status is, you know, there's a few different levels. There's non weight bearing, which means no weight, um, toe touch or touchdown means that they can contact the floor for balance, but there's no weight on that, um, uh, on that extremity. Partial weight bearing is about 25 to 50% as, um, and then total weight bearing is hundred percent and then sometimes it's as tolerated whatever the patient can handle um, and you have to consider their pain and their mobility status so last but not least this is will be my last uh um part of this and there is a hip fracture powerpoint or hip fracture um, video coming next um but um preventing fractures as a whole think safety um so everything comes down to use of seatbelts um, to prevent car, like, or if not preventing car accidents, but preventing excess damage from car accidents, um, driving within the posted speed limits can definitely help to prevent fractures. I actually was, um, what do you call it? Um, well, actually, uh, it's not listed on here. Um, but um, I don't know if any of you guys are aware, but in Texas, they have a lot of um, traffic circles or roundabouts, as some people call them. And a lot of people do not know how to properly use them. Traffic circles would be a great fix for having less traffic lights if people knew how to use them. And I sadly had to use my um, noise device, aka known as my uh, my horn on my car today uh, with a person who was not um, following the correct etiquette. Um, you're not supposed to come to a complete stop in a roundabout. Um, you're actually supposed to keep going and can cause more of an accident if you stop. Um, but that's just a little PSA for those that may not know how to use roundabouts. You are supposed to yield, not stop, um, to traffic to your left. Um, but if there's no one there, then you're supposed to go. Um, otherwise, you can end up with a fracture or you can cause someone else's fracture because you're brake checking them but just life lessons. I'm not an aggressive driver at all. Um, anyway, so driving within posted speed limits is definitely important. Um, avoiding any sort of distracted driving, like using a cell phone um, or, um, you know, um, definitely getting a little too excited about your, um, you know, music or things like that. Or um, if you have a friend that talks too much or is very distraction, or if you have a five-year-old that um, screams random things, sometimes it can be very distracting. Um, not driving under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or rage. Um, and, um, you know, because definitely that can impair your ability to safely drive a vehicle. Uh, warm up before exercising to prevent injury, protective equipment during sports and activity like helmets during football. Um, if you work in a place where you could easily have a fall or an injury, safety equipment, helmets, 
uh, make the world go round when it comes to preventing injuries. Now I know helmets don't look cool. They don't feel cool. They don't give you that same, like, um, really like where you're just like, man, I'm such a cool guy or girl, um, you know, when you're wearing them. But um, as a ICU nurse who has seen a lot of traumas, there is a a sharp, I was going to say sharp and steep at the same time, a steep difference between a patient that comes in motorcycle accident with a helmet um, versus a patient that comes in motorcycle accident without a helmet. Uh, protect that beautiful brain of yours. You work so hard to get through nursing school. And so it, it's always so sad to see people that end up having injuries um, and they weren't wearing safety equipment. Um, safe environment for the older adult um, to prevent falls. So you want to we talk about this a lot with osteoporosis and then also um, calcium and vitamin D for bone health. So, um, you know, if you already have weak bones, you're going to be more likely to fall, have fractures, uh, things like that. So that is the end of the fracture lecture. I know it seemed like it was never going to end, but I hope you had some fun like I did. Bye.